So I had the pleasure of introducing Sirella Simoncini, and she's a faculty member in the Systems Engineering Program. Uh, let me tell a little bit about myself. I know many of you, but I don't know also many of you. So my name is Hussein Topolola. I'm a faculty member at the School of Operations Research and Information Engineering. And I'm going to claim that I'm the last faculty member here at, Cor at Cornell to have been influenced by the JMMR uh, gang. <laughs> and, um, and I'm very happy that I was influenced by them. Um, again, you know, they created this amazing body of research, and everybody outside inside Cornell read this work and influenced by it, so that sort of influenced us everybody. But in addition to that, I saw their work ethic for first time, and I saw uh, how they dealt with people, their colleagues and their students, in a really, really human way. And people outside Cornell could not see that, so I feel very privileged uh, to have seen that aspect of their work, their work ethic, and uh, the human touch they put into their work. So, Thank you very much. Well, you know, Peter, Jeff, Robin, uh, Max, he was someone on the left. Thank you very much for all the influence in our lives. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Sveta now. Um, so Sveta, again, as I said, she's a faculty member in the systems engineering program. And the one thing that was very special about Peter was that, uh, unlike many of us, he was able to think with both sides of his brains. So he was a mathematically strong person, but also he appreciated good design. He appreciated things that looked good. And so during the time that I've been at Cornell, she put some emphasis on the systems engineering program. We built it. We were a program where we were mailing videotapes to different kinds of uh, companies. When I first started Cornell Tech, then we moved to CDs. Now we were doing it all online. Uh, the systems engineering distance learning program grew, grew, grew and grew. Um, and Sveta joined us, and she, she, she sort of, again, put the human touch to our research, and she taught us, like, how to talk to the customers, to understand what they want, elicit their preferences, and to really design engineering systems that could make changes in uh, humans' lives. And we really, really appreciate her presence because that's something we lack a lot in, and she's going to talk about systems design thinking. Thank you, Thank you. Please call me Siri. I have a very long and very Italian name. And uh, despite the fact that I don't have a cell phone, everybody calls me Siri, which is pretty long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about system design thinking, which is a, a process that was born here at Cornell in systems engineering, and thanks to the vision of Peter Jackson, the farmer Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I was the, the last seed that, that planted at Cornell. So uh, what is a systems design thinking? It's a blended process, a process that integrates the efficiency of systems engineering with the effectiveness of design thinking. Now, given the audience, I don't need to explain what systems engineering is, also because I'm not an engineer and an architect, but I will spend a few words on design thinking. So we can trace the concept of design thinking back to the 60s, but it's really with David Kelly, founder of IDEO in the 90s and founder of the Stanford D School in 2004, the design thinking becomes a codified process, a process with its own language and grammar. And this is design thinking in brief. It consists of five phases. We start by empathizing with the users in order to understand their real needs. So we can define the right problem to solve, and that's the effectiveness of design thinking. We then move to ideation. We ideate uh, solutions uh, to the problem or to the problems so with a big emphasis on divergent thinking. And then we want to prototype uh, these uh, solutions as soon as possible with very low resolution mockups because we want to go back to the empathy fieldwork as soon as possible and test uh, these uh, solutions with the users. Then, uh, depending on the feedback that we get from uh, the testing uh, fieldwork, we start the iteration loop. So it really depends on the feedback. Maybe we have to start empathizing all over again. Maybe we have to redefine the problem to solve. Maybe we have, it's just as simple as to go back to the ideation board. So there's no doubt that design thinking has proven to be a very powerful process. And the process that, in the recent year, got the attention of the systems engineering community. And especially for two things. It's human-centered framework, and it's focused on divergent thinking. And there is an overarching discussion out there. And this is just a collection of uh, recent papers uh, where the systems engineering community 
uh, is discussing about uh, the conveniency of trying to merge design thinking with systems uh, engineering. Um, even more than that, about the idea of merging design thinking with system thinking. And they all agree that uh, um, there is a potential synergistic effect of the combination of the two ways of thinking. And in particular, when they're talking about the design thinking and systems engineering, they all say that they are both well-established methodology and that they share somewhat parallel process. But despite these similarities, they agree that uh, uh, try to blend them is not so straightforward. It's uh, challenging. And in fact, it has been a challenge for us too. And when uh, I did this research on um, you know, papers published on the subject, when Peter and I were uh, writing our own paper on the, uh, our blended process uh, that we later presented at the ISERC conference one year ago. And I did this research because honestly, we, were, we had been so occupied with doing our <coughs> blending that we didn't even know if someone else out there had tried to do the same thing. And I remember that I came to, to your office and said, Peter, Peter, nobody really did it. We are pioneers. And not only that, there was a big demand out there about find a, find a way to blend the two ways of thinking. So now I'm going to present you our own blending effort, systems design thinking, and I'm going to do so through a series of case studies, basically by telling you our story, the story that brought us here. A story that started in 2012 when uh, uh, Peter Jackson and Linda Nozick asked me to um, facilitate our first uh, D-School style workshop for distance learning students who were, who were coming for one week uh, in the summer. And uh, the workshop, uh, they, um, distance learning students liked uh, the workshop. They really did see the value of introducing design thinking into the program. So based on that feedback, the following year in 2013, uh, Peter promoted the extension of the uh, design thinking process to a number of on-campus classes. That point, not just for systems engineers, not just for engineers, open to um, more uh, colleges on campus. And students were still pretty enthusiastic about design thinking, but the systems engineering students had a big question. How do we integrate design thinking with systems engineering? Because here in this program, you are teaching us two processes, design thinking and systems engineering, that are kind of similar, but kind of not. And we would like to see if we can merge them together. We don't know how. We don't even know if it's possible. So that's when uh, Peter Jackson and Linda Nozick, at the time they were the leaders of uh, the systems engineering program, they tasked me with finding a way to blend the two processes. And they authorized a special image project as a field study. So we put a bunch of students together, and we partnered with the world-known manufacturer of fitness equipment. And we gave the students the challenge to redesign the fitness experience. Very broad challenge. So we planned a first semester of design thinking only. And then uh, Peter's idea was to introduce systems engineering in the second semester, start integrating with systems engineering tools, but keeping design thinking in the loop. So we spent one semester at the gym, um, I, I did it too with the students, and uh, we observed the uh, um, gym users in their environment, we pretended to be gym users, we interviewed the gym users, and after one semester, student students came up with a very interesting insight. The managing users had a particular need expressed in functional terms. As in, and here I'm quoting what one user said, I needed to be able to lift my grandson into his car seat without hurting my back. That's why I'm coming to the gym. So based on that intriguing insight, uh, uh, students uh, uh, developed what I still think was a very innovative concept the functional fitness zone, where the machinery, the equipment is uh, grouped and customized around the functional objectives. Then it was time to introduce the systems engineering tools. Now I'm an architect, that's my background. So, of course, Peter paired me with uh, a seasoned systems engineer, Wes Hewitt, expert in seasonal. And while I, the architect, expert in design thinking, and in the engineer, expert in systems engineering, 
were really eager to experiment with the each other way of thinking and try to do this blending, the students, the very students who had asked us to try to blend the two processes, now they were complaining. We're complaining a lot that all those systems engineering tools were slowing down the creative momentum of design thinking, of the design process. Okay, we managed to arrive at the end of the second semester, and after several iterations, we were ready to show our prototype to the manufacturer at the quarters. Actually, we went there, and with their help, we built the functional fitness zone. Now, the corporate executives were ambivalent. They were intrigued by the concept, but they were questioning about the validity of the insight that was supporting this concept. So they were asking us, how exactly did you get that insight? The insight I was showing you before. How many users said the same things? Where are the numbers? Where are the numbers? Because they were saying, you, you understand, before even starting thinking of implementing this idea, spending money and time, we needed to make sure we need the numbers and we didn't have any numbers. So we failed. We failed because we had a uh, uh, good ins insight and uh, uh, innovative concept, but it never got implemented, so we had nothing. So I started thinking at that point, what did we do wrong? What has just happened here? This is what happened. I know that Peter likes the metaphor a lot. Um, as uh, the systems engineering community noted, uh, despite the similarities, Blending design thinking and systems engineering is challenging. It's not an easy task because they're very different to the core. It's like mixing oil and water. They are similar. They're both liquids. They come in bottles. But if you try to <laughs> mix them, this is what happens. They naturally separate. And we didn't want that. We wanted to achieve a seamless, elegant process, not just a juxtaposition of design thinking tools and systems engineering tools. But the reality is just we just reach like a partial blending. We had used a lot of oil in the first semester when we were doing all that empathy field work. And when we started pouring water in the second semester, it was too late. It was too late for systems engineering to fortify to structure the fluffiness and the ambiguity of the empathy field work. And it was too late to nicely blend with the momentum of design thinking. So there's no doubt that design thinking is powerful, and there's no doubt that uh, uh, empathy, empathizing with the users, they find the right problem to solve, it's really important. But I really started thinking here. We, uh, design thinking might need some help. It needs some help when, when it comes to, to transform these emotions into data, into numbers that we can capture, model, and store in order to validate the insight. Because we did have a great insight and a great concept, but we couldn't prove the relevance. So my first thought was, let's try to introduce design thinking, the systems engineering early on in the process while we're starting the empathy field work. I remember I came to your office and they told you that, like, hmm, interesting. <laughs> the other thought was we have to operate on both uh, processes. We needed to make design thinking more structured and systems engineering more open-ended, more uh, design thinking friendly in order to facilitate a seamless integration. Basically, we have to find the right detergent to mix oil and water. This way, we would answer to the complaint of the students. They were happy that we were using systems engineering tools, but they were complaining that all those tools were slowing down the creativity. So we put together a new team of students, and we gave them a new challenge, redesign the family play experience, and then we purpose we we decided for a very broad uh, challenge because uh, we wanted to keep the ambiguity and the openness of the design thinking process and see how systems engineering will deal with that from the very beginning. I decided to keep uh, the design thinking uh, process as the main scaffolding for uh, the new process, but fortified uh, with systems engineering tools uh, from the very beginning. So I sent the students out in the field to do empathy field work, empathizing with local families. 
and I asked them to do immersion, pretending to be those family members, uh, observation, observing the family members in their environment, and engagement, engage and interact with the family members with open-ended questions. Now, immersion, observation, and engagement are design thinking tools, nothing new here. But what I did is to structure, to fortify, to organize the empathy fieldwork very carefully because I wanted the students to capture the quality of the emotions, very important, but also the quantity. I wanted them to be ready to transform the emotions into data, which is going to happen now with the defined phase. Now, the defined phase in design thinking is the most important part, is when you define the right problem to solve. But in design thinking, is uh, the entire design thinking process a little bit, you know, fluffy. So you, are, you, are, you have collected all these emotions, you unpack them somehow, and then you come up with like a one great insight. And then on that great insight, you base your personas or your point of views, the composite characters, the users you are going to design for. And usually in design thinking, it's one, maybe two. They're not really interested in complexity. I decided to fortify this uh, step very carefully, and I divided it into two steps, unpacking and modeling. Now, unpacking, uh, like every single step in our process, can be done hands-on with uh, post-its, markers, uh, pictures on a wall, or digitally. Normally, I ask my students to do both because I'm completely obsessed with uh, uh, capturing every single step of the process, not just the results. I want them to be able to go back at any moment and, and see what, they, what the data is. is. So and we normally do both. Anyhow, we started unpacking all this information from immersions, observations, and engagement very carefully, making sure that we were capturing everything, mm -hmm. even things that we wouldn't think were important. Then I developed mm -hmm. uh, a legend, a color -coded, coded legend, to trace uh, relations among uh, all these elements of the unpacking to find the patterns. This is systems engineering here, find patterns. And those patterns would help us develop what I call the basement of needs, insights, and surprises during the entire unfolding. So not just one or two insights, thousands of those. And uh, I wanted the students to make sure that they were capturing uh, the quantity of those uh, uh, emotion, emotions, not just the, the quality. So I always tell my students, uh, if a particular need, insight, or surprise keeps coming up again and again and again after unpacking one unpacking to the other one, you have to capture it again and again and again. Repetition is important. It tells us something. I want them to be able to transform these emotions into quantifiable data, and we came up with this oxymoron, if you will, emotional data. Then we started modeling. That's where I decided to use our first official systems engineering tool, the affinity diagram that in its adapted form, in its design thinking friendly form, becomes the emotional data relationship map. Here you see it can be done with post-its, and so on, or digitally. And we use it to capture the affinities, the emotional categories and subcategories, and intensities the number of uh, users expressing that particular emotion. And uh, then we trace the relations according to the same color-coded legend to assign increased importance to maybe some uh, numerically underrepresented category. And because it's both qualitative and quantitative, this map really helps uh, engineers feeling at ease with the fluffiness of the, the emotions and the empathy fieldwork. Then I developed uh, uh, one tool that I called the flow thoughts. I didn't know how to call it, and then I said, well, it's a flow of thoughts. Let's call it flow of thoughts, which is basically a narrative description of the emotional data relationship map that you just saw. We are basically describing with words what has just happened, all the unpacking and modeling. And then it's visually enhanced by tracing more relations among the thoughts and quantitatively supported by the established weighted categories. And uh, we were observing that this process of blending words, numbers, visuals, pictures, and stories, like sentences, narration, really works synergistically. 
uh, the effectiveness of the design thinking process that target the right problem to solve by responding to emotions not only is not slowed down by systems engineering, it's enhanced by systems engineering, which transforms these emotions into numbers, into data. Then uh, we kept modeling by using another design thinking tools, the point of views I was talking about uh, before. We came up, came up with the three uh, point of views, the workaholic man, the creative child, and the interactive pet. By the way, the man is me, the child is my kid, and the pet is my cat, <laughs> in case you were wondering, because we have to use like, a real picture that you know, they don't have rights and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we gave them a like, social life, a work life, a key attributes, an age, a name, because we really want to flesh them out, right? These are the users we are going to design our product for. We want to care about them. Then, before jumping into ideation, I decided to use uh, two more systems engineering tools, because I felt that they need, at that point, to visualize and uh, synthesize all the results, um, all the complexity. So we use the uh, requirements diagram and the system context diagram that in their adapted form became the how might we capabilities diagram and the POV context diagram in their cross-pollinated uh, form with design thinking. The how might we capabilities diagram uh, uh, builds on uh, a design thinking tool, the how might we question, and transforms it into a main goal of the system, a main capability, and in sub goals of the system, in sub capabilities. And because uh, this diagram translates uh, the emotional data into requirements, really helps us stay on focus during the divergent phase of design thinking. But at the same time, because uh, these requirements are so high level, they're actually capabilities, at the same time, opens our mind to more, more than one possibility, right? So it has this double function, diverging, converging. Same thing with the point of view context diagram. It helps us stay on focus because it's a reminder of the user's needs that are represented in our point of view context diagram by the external entities. The external entities in a context diagram are mostly our point of views. Uh, but paradoxically, also helps creativity. And I say paradoxically because Normally, systems engineering tools are better at visualizing a current state more than envisioning uh, alternative possibilities. But not our point of view contest diagram. Our point of view contest diagram is a natural sparker of ideas with that uh, undefined system in the middle which is so filled with potential. And it's undefined because we don't know what the system is yet. We haven't even started brainstorming. This diagram is propedeutic to brainstorming. So, at this point, we uh, were acknowledging the twist. Uh, not only systems engineering wasn't slowing down design thinking, it was fostering the creativity. So we were pretty pleased about that. And these two diagrams are complementary. They really should be developed in parallel, back and forth. And both kept in sight when you ideate, because you have like a, an entire view of your empathy fieldwork. So we started ideating a school style, design thinking styles with a diverging, uh, exploring multiple options. But then converging is important too, especially for engineers, and we made sure that we were grouping, consolidating the ideas, uh, and rating them. So after rating, I decided to use another systems uh, tool that in its adapted form becomes the design space and trade-off diagram. <coughs> uh, access and the ideas are scored for both the desirability, how delightful they would be for the users, and on the other axis, uh, uh, feasibility and viability, how easy they are to implement. And because uh, this uh, diagram uh, um, really take in consideration both uh, being delightful and being easy, um, so the constraints but also the point of view of the users, really creates a bridge between uh, uh, the two main categories of students that I see every day, designers and engineers that are working together. Designers are trained to be risk embracers. It's the way we are. We're not crazy. We are trained to be that way. Uh, we're always in search of the not obvious answer. Why engineers are trained to be risk controllers, right? To find the one right answer that meets all the constraints. Now, both ways of thinking are valuable. Think about putting them together. And this is what we're trying to do here. 
because uh, via this diagram, the designers at least acknowledge the risk before jumping into it, <laughs> at least they are informed. At the same time, also the engineers. Maybe they are willing to accept the risk if it's an informed decision, if they know where the uh, idea sits in the diagram, <coughs> if they know what they have to do in order to improve the axis that is lacking and to control the risk. So we selected uh, one idea, one concept that we named catastrophe, which is a game where parents and kids build uh, creative objects that uh, then the cats uh, destroy by directed, uh, directed by a laser pointer. We used another uh, systems engineering tool, um, the concept sketch. Even this concept sketch is uh, adapted, right? Because we wanted to make sure that uh, a concept sketch for our process was a concept sketch that was depicting the use of the product. It wasn't focusing on the product, but was focusing on the users, our point of views, using the product. Then we started prototyping, and we found a lot of value <coughs> of going back and forth between the, the creative momentum of design thinking tools like rapid prototyping and body storming the use of the product, and at the same time, the validating function of the systems engineering tools like use case diagrams, activity diagrams, uh, uh, internal block diagrams, and block definition diagrams. And in particular, um, was interesting to see how to use uh, uh, the uh, bo body storming, body, stor body storm is the use of the product, and at the same time, in parallel, capturing the flow of those actions so with an activity diagram that in its adapted form becomes the emotional activity diagram because we're interested not just about capturing the flow of the actions. We wanted to identify the emotional state we want users to achieve with each action. That here, as you see, there is another layer. Those emoticons are identifying the emotional states. Then it was time to test uh, our product, so we went back to the field and this cool design thinking style showed on tell. We just give like the product in the hands of the users and we observe them and using it and misusing it. So these are all the testing we did. And then we, it was time to capture these uh, um, results into, and we used um, uh, this cool uh, feedback capture grids, uh, uh, testing matrices. But we, bu we built on it. We uh, made sure to um, trace our relations, uh, see patterns, and build a new basement of emotional data that we later modeled uh, uh, with the same process we used for the defined phase. And we determined what needed to be fixed. So by surprise, cats are distracted by the great objects and don't participate as anticipated. <laughs> like faculty members. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It was actually very good that we failed. I really like to fail because failing brings more opportunities. So I said, okay, great, we failed, so now we can experiment how to iterate using our system design thinking process. So we started iterating, so we thought, okay, let's go back to the capabilities diagram, let's revise though, let's get rid of the encourage creativity, and then we started revising all the systems engineering tools, and in particular, we found that the emotional activity diagram turned out to be a great platform for designing these emotional states and then validating these emotional states with the testing and then retargeting the emotional states with the iteration. So now I'm going to go through the entire process so you see it at once. And I framed in red all the design thinking tools, in blue all the systems engineering tools, and in green, the tools that I created to facilitate the blending, but let's remember that every single design thinking tool and every single systems engineering tool in this process has been cross-pollinated, has been uh, adapted to facilitate the blending. So this is empathy, this is define, this is ideate, prototype, and test. So, in general, we can say that in adapting systems engineering tools to uh, support the design thinking, to merge with design thinking, as you saw, we chose uh, diagrams over spreadsheets, and this is pretty obvious why. Uh, because, you know, the, vi the visual impact of the diagrams really helps blending with the uh, uh, design process. But we also uh, further enhance the visual effectiveness by adding uh, colors, uh, pictures, uh, emoticons, 
At the same time, very important for me was to preserve the integrity of the seasonal language. And so uh, even when we're doing hand-drawn diagrams, when we are transporting the diagrams in like a PowerPoint, like in a digital format, we make sure that we are uh, true to the uh, seasonal language. And uh, while Seawet and I went even farther, we experimented, experimented with uh, embedding this emotional data in diagrams uh, uh, made with seasonal modeling programs. So here you see an emotional activity diagrams with the, emo uh, the emotions embedded in the diagram and the point of view contest diagram with the pictures embedded in the program. So we can model the emotional data within the program. Then it was time to replicate uh, and we were ready to assess the process with the large student body. And in 2014, I partnered with Professor Robert Shepard uh, in the mechanical engineering department to teach innovative uh, product design via digital manufacturing, which is a class where the students are divided in teams and they have to design household products uh, with commercial potential. This is a series of pictures from our first iteration in 2015. Here again, we, uh, we gave the students a challenge, we designed the family experience and uh, we asked them to step out of their comfort zone and to conduct empathy field work. And every time we do so, we notice that they feel a little bit awkward about it. Going out in the field, ask the questions, so live with these uh, strangers, families for a week. But as they translate emotions into data with our system design thinking process, we see them overcome this uneasiness and embrace the ambiguity. Uh, be okay with the ambiguity of the empathy field work. Engineers are often stereotyped as uh, analytical thinkers uh, that solve problems that someone else has defined for them. And we really wanted uh, to overcome uh, this uh, stereotype. Uh, and in every class I teach or co-teach or a project that I advise, we really wanted to empower uh, the engineers to learn how to define the right problem to solve before solving it. So we are now at our uh, second iteration of the class. Uh, we changed the <coughs> challenge, we designed the other experience. The class has been pretty successful. We, last of all, we had uh, more than 70 students, which is a huge number for a design <coughs> class. Uh, the class is uh, very interdisciplinary. We have engineers, uh, design environmental analysis students, uh, information science students, law school students that usually jump in the second semester when the class blends with the consumer product design image project to help the students uh, go through the patent process, which is something that we encourage students to do, to patent uh, uh, their products, uh, and they usually do. And uh, this semester, actually, one team, not only they filed the provisional patent, they also incorporated, this is how serious they were about their product, and they got selected by Stanford Center on Longevity Design Challenge among 75 submissions, 43 universities, 12 countries, as the most uh, ready to implement, the most market ready product. And this was done in 14 weeks. Because of my past as regional planners, I wanted uh, to uh, see if this process was uh, flexible and scalable and could address a complex uh, problem, a regional problem. So in 2015, I launched a new class, Design Thinking for Complex Systems, and I partner with the uh, Ithaca Tompkins County Transportation Council and uh, the city of Ithaca to redesign Ithaca Mobility. So this was a big class of 35 students, 35 students representing planning, landscape architecture, design environmental analysis, and of course, systems engineering. And the difficult part here was to tackle the very complex empathy fieldwork, something that design thinking wouldn't be able to do it. I had to use a lot of system thinking here. So it was challenging, it took me a while. Then I decided to uh, divide it in four concentric areas and divide the class in four teams and have one team studying mobility users from outside counties going to downtown, another team from outside towns going to downtown, and then the third team from suburbs to downtown, and the fourth team studying uh, users uh, inside the city limits. And so I divided the class in uh, four fields of action, I send them out in the field to collect emotional data. It was two years ago, the coldest winter in the history of Ithaca, and they had to do this for two weeks. And I told them that uh, it was a good thing that was so cold, because you could nail down the worst case scenario, so I convinced them that actually it was good. 
um, nobody died, they all survived. <laughs> and uh, so back to the lab, they started unpacking and modeling all this emotional data separately. Then it was time to address complexity, and that was the intriguing part for me because I really like, uh, you know, as a regional plan, I like these complex problems. So I asked them to put together one overarching uh, my to capabilities diagram out of, of the four, and a big point of view contest diagram. And this is where the students really resisted me. They didn't want to do it. Every time I teach this class, when we get to this point in which they have to integrate all this emotional data, they don't want to do it. This is interesting. When I send them out in the field to, to collect this emotional data separately, somehow they get attached emotionally to their own package of emotional data and they don't want to share it. They don't want to share it. So I had to force them, then they were ready because especially with this contest diagram, you see it's made of 14 external entities, 14 personas that are color coded by region. And because we were able to see all of them all together, we were able to address the complexity of all the relationship that can happen among those users because of the use of the system. We were in fact able to understand that the transportation system can facilitate socialization, can address a sense of community. And this is like something that keeps coming up every time I teach this class, addressing the empathy field work differently, it always comes up. So it must be true. So we are at our second iteration of design thinking for complex system. Where the, so last uh, this spring we focused on uh, TCAT issues. And between the uh, class and the image project that I created, uh, blending with the class this semester, I have more than 50 students uh, uh, basically working with TCAT and for TCAT addressing different issues. Uh, they are rerouting routes, they are relocating stops location, they are um, studying a real-time bus information system interface, and they are redesigning a system of bus shelters, small, medium, big size. And as we speak, as we, we, they're actually building in Carpenter the real, si real scale uh, uh, of the medium uh, uh, of the medium size. Almost done. Because I'm an architect, of course, I wanted to uh, see how to apply system design thinking to an architectural project. That was like my ambition. And in 2015, I started facilitating this, pro this image project, Sustainable Education Ghana, one of the most successful image projects we have in the program. And it's sponsored by a UN NGO, Voices of African Mothers, who are devoted to promote equal education opportunities in Africa. And so we are now a team of 25 students, architects, designers, system engineers, <coughs> who are designing a sustainable school for these girls in the Volta region of Ghana. Here too, the difficult part was to tackle the empathy fieldwork. Our users are mostly kids, elementary and middle school kids. So how do we do that? So we decided to let them draw their emotions. So we collected all these drawings and then we started unpacking directly the drawings on the board, unpacking and modeling them. And I have to say that especially the engineers were a little bit skeptical <laughs> at the beginning about unpacking and model drawings made by kids and the right numbers, but we did it and we got so much information. The most interesting one, the emotional importance of the architectonical element of the roof for the sense of security, the sense of the identity of these kids. And so we built, we designed our building based on that uh, insight and more other insight, but mostly the, the roof element. And it's a design that's almost completed. The students went to Ghana uh, in the winter and they uh, presented the design to stakeholders, uh, to uh, um, local contractors, local architects, and of course took the opportunity to test it again with, uh, with the kids. Now for me, uh, Facilitating, uh, advising this project was extremely fulfilling. Being an architect that has worked with engineers all, all her life, um, because I really think that uh, there is a potential for a bridge between the two professions, uh, despite of what the way we hear the Cornell, the dragon and the yes. whatever that is. Um, so uh, I uh, really witnessed architects and engineers working 
uh, together, not just a side by side, but together, integrated the different ways of thinking, and the architects were appreciating uh, the role of systems engineering in addressing such a complex problem. And at the same time, the engineers were appreciated of uh, the not obvious thinking of the architects. So they really worked together to transform these emotional data into the design of the building. And something that started arising at this point, the final twist, is that we had started uh, by teaching design thinking to uh, engineers. That was our goal at the beginning, but now we are kind of teaching systems engineering to architects, to designers, to not engineers or systems <coughs> engineers, because I'm not an engineer and I understand this process, right? So we're, it's really a process that makes uh, systems engineering uh, um, open to a wider section of the population. So I had a lot of students that actually want to come, to come to my classes because they want to learn systems engineering, <laughs> not design thinking. So they're coming from architecture, they're really interested in systems engineering, so that's pretty amazing. This is just an overview of the classes that I teach, so teach or projects I advise and advise, so just to give you an overview. And uh, <coughs> this fall and spring, I have had 239 students collectively um, learning how to design via system design thinking, so learning systems engineering as well as design thinking. And the conclusions. So, thanks to Peter, we have system design thinking into the program right now. It's a seamless process. We wanted it to be seamless, flexible, and scalable. A process in which systems engineering reinforces and informs design thinking. It doesn't slow down anything. It enforces the, cre the creativity of the design process. And surprise, disseminates systems engineering to a broader audience. Future research, we have uh, nailed down uh, product design, infrastructural design, architectural design. Uh, I actually started already experimenting with uh, um, using this process for organizational problems. I think it's a field where there's a lot of potential. I'm not an expert in organizational behavior, so it would be nice to be paired with uh, like an expert, but something that definitely I will keep working on next year. So that's it, and if you have any questions. They get yeah. the two technical <laughs>
So one of the surprises you mentioned was that when the teams went off and collected their own data, uh, you found it very difficult for them to force a common viewpoint yeah. from their data. Uh, so that was a surprise. That was a surprise. Uh, Any way that, uh, is there a technique or a process step that we add that... Uh, I just help? force that. You just force it. I just, <laughs> I need to be honest with you. I, that, that point of view contest diagram, I started doing myself. Because there was like, do it. go and do it. And then I had a couple of system students. One, I actually called him the integrator. I gave him this role to feel important. I'm the integrator, okay, I'm going to help you integrate. Because the first time I thought, they didn't want to show, they wanted to come up with four different ideas. I said, this is Ithaca mobility. We have to address this problem in its complexity. That's something that I have been noticed, that systems engineering students are really not into think about, you know, the system. They resist that. And so, I mean, I don't know, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. For, for me, I'm an architect. I'm not, I don't, this, I learn these tools. This is not something that we learn at school. But we do, you know, everything we do has to be, you know, systemic. So for me, it was pretty obvious, but not for them. But I just forced them, uh, and they did it. That was my technique. <coughs> okay, thank you. Okay.